How do you keep your code base evergreen? Let's say you recently started a greenfield project and you know it's gonna be maintained over years, adding new functionality, and you don't want it to turn into legacy or something that's considered brownfield. I'm Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com and here are my three tips for keeping your code base evergreen. Before I get into my tips, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. The first is really understanding what the stability and advancements are for the core pieces of technology that you're building your system around. That is the actual underlying platform and programming language, the frameworks and libraries, like the real core stuff, your databases, et cetera, infrastructure. That, you're, that core foundation that you're really building your entire system on, understanding what the stability of it is. How often are they making breaking changes or major uh, version increments? Are there breaking changes? It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just being aware of what the likelihood of that is happening and how it's going to affect your development moving forward. And you're going to have to be able to deal and make changes if there are breaking changes. So when you're picking, or if you already have, what that underlying technology is, really kind of get a sense of how things have been moving forward, what the stability of it is. Is it a new product? Is there gonna be a lot of breaking changes? Has it been around for a long time? This could just be the platform that you know, and if you do know it, then you'll understand kind of the history and what it's like moving forward. As an example, when I started a code base nine years ago, it was running on .NET Framework 4.7 on Windows. Today, it runs on .NET 8 under Linux. The reason why this can even happen is because I bet on .NET, and while there is a transition from .NET Framework to .NET Core, which is now just referred to as .NET, there was a transition there, which was done over time. I'll get more to that in a second. But Microsoft is really incredible at backwards compatibility on that platform. So a lot of the code really didn't have to evolve that much over time to make that transition. The second tip is about dependencies and when you decide to take dependencies. I like to say that when you decide to take a dependency, it's now your problem. Everything about it is your problem. If it's not maintained anymore, it ha whether it has security issues, whether it breaking changes, similar to the first thing there, that first tip, it really is important about when you decide to take a dependency and on what. A big part of this, however, is a lot of people just abstract any dependencies so you own that type. I'm not concerned about that as so much I am concerned about the degree of coupling you have to a dependency. For example, let's say I'm using a third-party library for generating PDFs. Now, when I say degree of coupling, what I mean by this is, do I depend on that library in, let's say, 12 different usages in 12 different spots in my code base, or is it 200? So if we ultimately have to replace that third-party library with something else, am I fixing 12 places or am I fixing 200 places? That's when we kind of get into the area of maybe I want to create some abstraction. And again, abstraction for me, the point of it is to simplify the surface area of that API that I'm using, whether it's a third-party library or something my, of my own. It's to simplify it for my use case. I'm not concerned about dependencies and creating an abstraction for everything when I only have one usage for it. So again, it's just the really thinking about when you're taking a dependency, how you're using that API, and the degree of what you're using it and how you're gonna be coupled through your code base to that third-party library or framework. Now, the third tip really explains why the second tip is so important. So there's only one way to eat an elephant, one bite at a time. And what I mean by this is when you have a large system that's been developed over years, I don't wanna think of that large elephant or what we think of as a big system that turns into a big ball of mud, or like I often say in this channel, as a turd pile. I wanna be thinking about creating little turd piles. The reason why this is so important because it allows you to make incremental changes in a localized area for a variety of reasons. One of them could be because you have some type of dependency that's no longer supported. Going forward, you can, in some little small turd pile, you can then change it to some other third-party dependency to replace it. Maybe going forward when you're developing some new localized area, you can use something new. But it's not even just dependencies, it's your own code and how you develop with what patterns, etc. That's gonna evolve over time. Everybody knows this. When you look at some old code that you've written, 
even not that long ago, you're thinking, oh, maybe we should do this differently moving forward. That's what defining boundaries or these little turd piles allows you to do. As a real world example, when we were talking about that nine year old code base, it had to evolve over time. Because we had boundaries, we had different DB contexts using entity framework, and we could evolve it. When entity framework core came out, we could slowly change boundaries, those little turd piles, to start using it. It was still using the same underlying database, but one at a time, when we were developing something new, we could start leveraging it. And then over time, we could start changing those existing places that were using Entity Framework to the Entity Framework core. It also allows you, because you define those boundaries, that underlying infrastructure or bigger changes that you want to make. For example, maybe at one spot, we were actually using our database. We figured event sourcing was there. So we're starting to use event store. We can make bigger changes because they're localized to that piece of functionality within that boundary. Keeping your code base evergreen to me is really about your ability to evolve and keep up with the pace of technology over time. Now, whether you need to keep up with that pace of technology and evolve with it is kind of a different story. But if you do, I think really the aspects of this are really understanding the platform, libraries, and frameworks that you're using, that you're betting on, and how much of pain it will be if they're evolving, how much that's gonna affect you and your code base and the changes you're gonna have to make with them. Keeping everything in within a boundary so you can localize kind of the, the collateral damage if they do make changes. That you can incrementally over time make those upgrades or just change your dependencies or change the way that you develop. If you have a long running code base that you've kept evergreen, let me know in the comments about your thoughts and what you've done to keep it evergreen. If you want a more deep dive detailed example of my personal experience going from .NET Framework and my example to .NET 8 that it is now and a lot that was involved in that over nine years, let me know and I can do a very specific video on that. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have questions or thoughts about things like this and you want access to my private Discord server, check the link in the description on how to join. And as always, please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.